and welcome to the program My Future. I'm Ruvena Kopadrinyatwa and I'm the moderator for this evening. In tonight's episode, we have the Honourable Deputy Minister of Sport, Arts and Culture, Tabitha Kanengoni Malinga. She's also the ZANU PF MP for Mazoe Central. Now we have uh, three key panelists in our discussion this evening, and they're going to be asking our Honourable Minister questions. There's also a broader panel of students from different parts of the country, and they're going to be given the opportunity too to engage with our Honourable Deputy Minister. So let me begin by welcoming and thanking you for coming, Honourable Deputy Minister thank, Tabitha Kanyamoni. Thank you, Venerable. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, let me introduce our panelists that are up front with us this evening. We've got uh, Lawrence Takayendesa, who is from Zengeza Too High in Lower Six, and he is the Leo Club President. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. And we have Louis Mpoko, who is also who's an Upper Six, and he is a Leo Club Chairperson. He is the Minister of State for Mashonaland uh, East, and he is the Interact Coordinator. Welcome to the program. Thank you, ma'am. And we also have Moline Owande. Moline is in Lower Six. She is at uh, Harare High, and she is a Harare City Junior Councillor. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to My Future. We are now going to get into the questions from our students for our Honourable Deputy Minister, Tabith Kanengoni Malinga. And we're going to start off with Lewis Mpoko. Please go ahead. In as much as I know that we air out our views as children, what is the ministry doing to involve children in the decision-making process? Our ministry, as you know, used to be um, called the Ministry of Education, Sport, Arts and Culture. Then it was split um, and it's now a standalone ministry that is responsible for sport, arts and culture. What we are trying to do is to create a relationship with the Ministry of Education, um, that's primary and secondary education, as well as high-end tertiary education, so that whatever we try to do in terms of sport, arts and culture uh, links directly with the schools and the children can benefit. So what we have started to do is to draft, um, we've got a sports policy that we have and we also have a culture policy that we are currently drafting. It will outline how we intend to involve um, the youth, how we intend to involve students in getting themselves started in terms of empowerment programs in sport, arts and culture. So that is uh, in the works and we hope that uh, we will have that uh, together with the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education in terms of a relationship that can help empower the, the youth. Now, we, when I'm hearing what you're saying, do we trust that the ministry perhaps even has a open dialogue with young people such as this? Absolutely. You know, we have always said since the inception of our ministry that we have an open door policy. Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean that um, anybody is free to come to us to chat, to talk about their ideas, to air their grievances and such. But all our programs cannot succeed without these um, young ladies and gentlemen. So if you look at um, activities like independence celebrations, um, 21st February celebrations, and many other colorful celebrations that we host that have our ministry involved, we do that with the students. Sure. So that is our opportunity to interact with them, to um, see where they want to go and how we can assist them together with the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education. Right. So we try to create as many platforms as we can that involve um, the students so that we have a chance to interact with them. So let me come now to Lawrence Takayendesa, who also has a question for you. My concern is that we, as school children, we pay a sports fee every time on our levies. But the problem is when we reach district levels, with sports, let's say the Tamba Bora and Shimanya. Usually, my schools they say at Namaria to proceed. So, my concern is what's the ministry doing about that? It's true about Namari, but at the same time, it was also one school as Namari to win Rembier. You are talking about um, three different levels the school level, where mm -hmm. uh, schools are asking um, parents to pay sports levies. Now these levies are used um, for your sporting activities at the school to develop your infrastructure, to help you when you travel and you're representing the school. Then when you get to the district level or when you go above the school level, 
then we have associations that are supposed to represent um, whoever is picked to play for teams. So we have, for example, like the National Athletics Association, we have the Rugby Association and so on and so forth. So they are now supposed to take it up from there and try to bring in kids that are coming from, from high school to come and play at club level. Then we have the third level, which is which we, uh, where our ministry comes in, which is when we're talking about national teams. As a ministry, we try to work closely with our associations and um, federations. They, they, they um, expect us to give them funding for everything that they do, but unfortunately it's not possible for a government to fund everything. So we as a government are expected to provide a certain percentage towards um, teams that are going to represent us as a nation. So again, as government, we come in when we have national teams. Um, they come to us, we try to sit down with them, they tell us what their challenges are, and as ministry and as parliamentarians as well, we're supposed to then use that platform to create uh, a conducive environment to grow our athletes, make sure that athletics or whatever sport or arts and culture event becomes a career option and not just seen as leisure or something you can do here and there. The challenge is that um, there are some sports that are individual type sports, um, like tennis, um, golf, then we have motorsport. Um, those are individual sports that also turn out to be very expensive. And then you have um, national teams that have 20 to 30 people, which might actually need less. So we try to help the parents as much as we can, but there are certain regulations and rules and statutes around how the government gets involved. So we can only do as far as um, our jurisdiction goes. Honourable mm. Deputy Minister, um, for a young, talented athlete, to get to the point where they're now in your jurisdiction at mm -hmm. national level. Yes. They need support mm -hmm. from the lower level that you said that as a ministry you don't directly engage with. Mm -hmm. How are they supposed to ever get to national level if, as Lawrence was saying, even at high school level or getting into provincial level mm -hmm. and then you know higher than that or club level, there are no resources mm -hmm. to support their career and to support their talent? This brings me back to the issue of the, the policies that we're drafting. Mm -hmm. In the absence of a policy, um, you cannot push even a finance ministry, for example, to invest in your ministry or to invest in certain <coughs> activities. So our policy is going to be covering all those things because we want a link. We want the kids. We still want them. We still mm. need them. We mm. want to groom them because um, grassroots development or youth development is one that feeds into the national teams. Yes. We can't expect to have a national team uh, where we have someone who never played football in high school but they only started playing at club level and expect to have a good team that will sure. win matches and compete effectively. Sure. So our policies will then help to push um, finance um, to give more money to the ministry and to actually take it seriously that we're not here to play, mm. we're here to create livelihoods and we're here to contribute to the fiscus. So. When this is done, which we are hoping to be done by around June, um, that's when we're hoping to present these policies to Cabinet and to Parliament right. as well. When this is done, then we can effectively start pushing for um, our involvement, or right. in, direct or indirect, in the schools. Right, because mm -hmm. I'm sure that is where the fallout starts, yes. at that lower level, that by the time Absolutely. you can help them, there's no one to help. Absolutely. Um, let's yes. come now to uh, the lady, Moline Owande. Please go ahead. What is the ministry doing to eliminate harmful social and cultural practices that are affecting children? And then the family demands from us a girl to bear children as compensation. Mm -hmm. What is the ministry doing? Okay, um, the first thing that I just want to clarify is um, your question is coming from a culture perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, our ministry has that word culture in it. Um, the culture that we deal with as a ministry is not the culture that is related to traditional practices uh, with the chiefs and processes that have to do with um, the, the issues you're talking about. Our culture issues are more entangled within the arts and um, trying to bring up um, Zimbabwe with from an artistic element, so to, so to speak. But it is important for us as a ministry, we are also um, vested stakeholders in issues that are related to gender balance and uh, disparities and things like that. 
we actually are part of a committee, um, well, our ministry is part of a committee in cabinet that deals with um, gender issues. And the Ministry of um, uh, Women and gender, gender and Community Development is developing their gender policy, which touches on issues that you are talking about. So as a ministry, our role is to make sure that our, our um, sister ministries, as it were, bring up those policies that protect the girl child, even when they're participating in areas that have to do with what we are doing as Ministry of Sport, Arts and Culture. Because that then feeds into what we are doing. That's a, a um, multi-sectoral issue the issue of gender and cultural practices and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Honorable Deputy Minister Tabitha Kanamgoni, who I know was a very good athlete uh, back in her day. I don't know if she still has it, but I a do. very talented basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue with more questions from our students right after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to My Future. This evening we are in studio with the Honourable Deputy Minister of Sport, Arts and Culture, Honourable Tabitha Kanengoni Malinga. All right, we're going to take some uh, questions from our live audience now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us give you the platform to ask our Honourable Deputy Minister any questions you might have. Uh, who's going to take it away? My question is this. Uh, in the sector of arts, art as in art, art, drawing, paintings, pictures, sticks and stones, paper, uh, graffiti. Uh, th the way I take it, if we could give a person pen and paper or sticks and stones instead of giving him a wall, he would create something that's marvelous, something that the world would want to marvel at. Like for example, um, uh, I'm not sure of the day where I passed through Mbari and I saw this massively beautiful picture of a child. I'm not sure what he was doing, but it was beautiful. What are we doing to showcase that talent? People. Uh, People are not being showcased. We don't even know that such people exist until one day you just pass through by Mbari and you say, oh, these people are talented. But then you Zimbabweans are not even recognized for that. But we've got wonderful, brilliant artists in Zimbabwe. Well, how are we showcasing it? Well, um, I want to understand your question. Are you saying that you support graffiti and graffiti artists should be supported? No, um, actually what I'm saying is this. People are ending up doing graffiti, it's because they, they don't have people to hear what they want to say. They want to express what they want to the, to the crowd, and the only way to do it is by graffiti. Okay, so what are we doing? What are we doing to stop graffiti and at the same time help them get help to okay, showcase? Okay, I understand mm -hmm. your question now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, I think this is actually a, a global problem. Mm -hmm. um, we, graffiti... Uh, there's no place where graffiti is legal, but mm -hmm. if you're uh, an artist at heart, you actually appreciate the idea behind graffiti and what mm -hmm. the artist is trying to express and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, you actually find that there's some artists that are graffiti artists and that's the only thing that they want to be. Mm -hmm. They want to sh express their art through graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, now, to the core of your question, what are we doing to create a platform where people that draw, people yes. that do art, like exactly. um, are recognized or they have a platform? Exactly. As a ministry, we have um, a parastatal called the National Gallery of Zimbabwe. Yes. It's one of our parastatals. Yes. And their duty and responsibility is to promote art that is like that. Yes. Um, so that they are able to display it. They create exhibitions for them. They come in and you get to e experience what yes. an artist's world is like. So they can have a whole exhibition just on them. They have all their artwork on the wall. They write, they have, we have their write-up. People come in and um, they express what their art is about. Now what the gallery then does is they then involve embassies, they involve other stakeholders that come in to view that in case they want to then fund the artist or take them on or create an opportunity for them overseas to go and display their work. Um, so this is what the National Gallery does. It's just a matter of going to them. Um, the head of the gallery is Mrs. Sibanda, Doreen Sibanda. You just go to her, you speak to her, and she can help um, in that way, or the gallery can help to express art in that way. We also have many festivals um, that are being done in Zimbabwe that have helped create a platform to, for, uh, for, art, um, for art artists. 
um, like for example, the Harare International Festival of the Arts, which is coming up uh, in April, okay. they showcase all types of art. Okay. And I know every time I go there, there's always artists that actually draw you from scratch or mm. they can draw your child from scratch and things like that. And these are opportunities for them to showcase their work. And with an international festival like that, you have people coming from all over the world and they get to see the talent that Zimbabweans have, and it's an opportunity for them to get contacts and to create business or to interact with other artists from overseas. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe it's a matter of us getting enough information out there mm -hmm. to people so that they know um, what they can do, where they can go. We need to maybe improve on that to make yes. sure that people know where to go to express um, their art. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Honourable Deputy Minister. I believe I've seen that same graffiti you're talking about in Bali. I have seen it. Um, yeah. But I believe it, it, there's it, a story behind that. They were actually mm. identified as mm. talented and asked to paint on those flats. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right, let's take our second question, please, from the audience. My question is that, as Zimbabwe, do we have policies like, um, for example, an exchange program whereby children from urban areas, like schools here in Harare, can go out there in places like Lotito to interact with children from rural areas so that we can gain some sort of exposure and we know what is out there because we don't want segregation. It is more like, right now it's more like of when you're in Harare and you're in Lotito, there is no exposure when we're together. Is there some policy that you have? I think that policy would uh, fall under the Ministry of education but I think it's a brilliant idea to do exchange programs like that most of the time when we think about exchange programs we think about exchange overseas but they can also be exchange uh, within our borders and they in the rural areas should also be able to come to the cities and actually see what's going on there but let's not um, create uh, this structural barrier where we say they are kids in the urban areas and kids in the rural areas and if you're in the rural area then you know nothing that is actually not the case there are some rural schools very good rural schools like howard mission school for example langham school these are all in Missouri, where children from urban areas c go there to go to school because i can think the value there academic standards and they also there are some church related schools like salvation army and the like so we shouldn't use that strict barrier to say urban and rural schools because children go to school anywhere and everywhere within Zimbabwe, which means there's already a dilution there. But let's say, let's just have exchanges of schools that are based in certain locations mm -hmm. so that they learn or experience um, what other schools are doing in terms of like cultural elements and, and the like. What has now happened with um, uh, t the, the, the ICT age is that all children have cell phones, they have um, smartphones, and this is not an urban or rural thing. Uh, we have children who are in rural schools who have smartphones, they're on WhatsApp, they're on Facebook, so they're experiencing um, the world through technology as well. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot that has happened through the introduction of ICT, and um, I would really want you to think critically um, when you think about this urban rural divide. I am uh, an MP for a, a rural constituency. So I get to I get surprises every single time mm -hmm. when I'm like, you guys know this and they know the latest dance and they do them better than the kids in Arari and <laughs> you know all, all that stuff. And it, they don't need to leave uh, Mazoe mm -hmm. to actually know about it. Right. But the exchange programs are an amazing idea. I think I'll actually speak to the Minister mm. of Primary and Secondary and yeah. relay that to him. I like that. Mm, mm. I think another policy that would, should be introduced is under Amaina Baba, Kanautina Tete Nambuya. It shouldn't just be a government <laughs> policy. I mean, anyway, um, let's go to our next question, please, from the audience. Right next to you, please. Thank you. All right, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, there's another question for you. Uh, please go ahead. What are you doing to promote cultural music as in opposed to dance or music? Can I check out nowadays in ghetto, like in, let's say, around the country? So I can't go dance or dance or cannot catalyze dance is not our culture. It comes from Jamaica. Takatarisa hip hop is not our culture. My cultural activities in terms of music, music, cultural music, 
music in the Chango Terera is now done so. So I'm asking you, what are you doing to promote this culture of music? We promote diversity in music and you can't choose a certain genre for artists. An artist can sing whatever it is that pleases them. But what we do encourage is um, that our artists sing music that has value, that has uh, positive content, um, that can help, that can impact positively on the youth. Funny enough, uh, you are complaining about dancehall, but I, I'm meant to believe that dancehall is the most popular, and the people that are actually trying to do the cultural type are not doing so well. And this is, uh, you know, artists do well according to their audience. Their audience are the ones that support them. So the audience drives the market, so to speak. And artists are trying to, to provide to the, to market needs because I mean it's a business we have to look at it as a business promoting drug abuse mm. they are Which supposed to like dance or artists are singing songs about drug about drugs and they mm. are promoting drug abuse mm -hmm. and we say could see those drug abuse are quite kind of my youth figure. The leader could be my youth figure. We don't have the leaders of tomorrow due to these songs. Because in any in the Katarisa could be like Toki, Arkin Banesh, and Madrags, and is the popular artist in Zimbabwe. Mm. It's like in the Kutu Stora could be in any I have put into Totora Madrags because mm. Kuyim Bwana. When it comes to putting things on the air, on radio, on TV and things like that. That is not our responsibility as a ministry. It now goes into Ministry of Information. Now what we can do though as a ministry is to maybe push for, um, push our other Art. ministries or the artists as a voice, the ministry being a voice to say, you should produce content that is like this. You should produce lyrics that are positive and the like. That's why I mentioned it. I said what we need to do is promote lyrics that help to develop our youth and mm. not bring, um, bring them down so to speak. Our hope is that our policies within our ministry that have to do with preserving cultural fabric or uh, pre preserving our heritage and feeding into the music, um, t telling people or encouraging them to sing music that is positive will feed into the other ministries because a policy is it, it's, about, it's for the whole nation. So it's just uh, like what I was talking about with the gender policy. It's being done by Ministry of Women's Affairs but it affects all ministries and the whole nation. We don't encourage um, singing about drugs. We don't encourage all that stuff. But what I also want to say is, as a nation, we all have a responsibility mm. towards creating what we feel or deem is positive for our children, for us, and for our country as a whole. You too have a responsibility as the youth to say or dictate what you want. And you are all junior parliamentarians and uh, senators and ministers. So use the space, that parliamentary space, to actually discuss these issues, come up with policies as youth. You can say whatever you want in parliament. You can even say, we want to ban this music. Then it will be legislation, because you're <laughs> legislators. You come up with the laws. So you also have a role to play. Don't expect government to do it on its own. If everybody wakes up in the morning and decides, we do not want to dance on Zimbabwe, then we just follow that. No, thank you very much, uh, Honourable Deputy Minister Tabitha Kaningoni Malinga. That is uh, the end of our program this evening. This is My Future. We are in studio with the future of Zimbabwe, and we've heard their questions uh, directed at our Honourable Deputy Minister. And uh, just to say on the lyrical content and all of that, arts is a culture, and usually when people are artists, or whether they're singing or making art, they are using it as an outlet. Mm -hmm. So instead of us looking at Zim dance or music and saying perhaps we should ban it because the content is dangerous, perhaps we need to look more deeply as to why people are singing about drugs. Perhaps it's an outlet for a greater social problem. I'm Ravenikopadeniatwa. Good night.